Welcome to this evening's special presentation of my film, 9-11 Remembered, A Day of Infamy. Folks, this is an amazing document of what happened 22 years ago now in New York City. I went there in 2011. I interviewed 22 survivors of the World Trade Center attacks. I have civilians that were in the towers that morning, both towers, the North and the South Tower. Fire, EMS, police, Port Authority, those who responded and I've got their stories. It's incredible. It's an amazing story I, and I'm happy to share it with you on my Voices of History YouTube channel and my Voices of History radio channel. Folks, this is near and dear to my heart. I've been talking about this film. Now you're going to have the opportunity to see the entire two and a half hour film. You're going to watch part one. I'll have part two available tomorrow evening, Sunday, September 10th, and then Monday morning, September 11th, I'll share part three. So this is part one tonight. Folks, and I want to thank Michael Sirofsky. Michael has been a supporter of my work. Michael lives in Denver, Colorado. He's an amazing man. Um, he's about my age, and we've, we've conversed, we've become friends, and he's making it possible for you to watch this presentation. And Michael, I look in this camera. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Let this in inspire you as you're helping me to share what happened, the whole story on 9-11 in New York City. And I just wanted to salute you too for your dedication to our veterans and my work in our country. Michael, God bless you, sir. Thank you. Okay, folks, this is part one. Like I said, part two will be tomorrow evening, Sunday, September 10th, and then September 11th, the 22nd anniversary of 9-11. I'll share part three so you can watch the entire film. So I just hope you enjoy it and understand how I say enjoy it. It's not entertainment, but I hope you learn a lot and are, are moved by this film like I am. It's just, I'm so grateful. I thank God that I'm able to share this with you today. And um, this is for my viewers and my subscribers. So, part one, 9-11 remembered, a day of infamy.
September 10th, I had just come off for vacation and I was in Pennsylvania Dutch and I actually uh, got home midnight. So I literally uh, went into my house, went into the shower, <laughs> got all my uniform stuff out ready because I have a 5.30 shift so I get up at four o'clock in the morning. So I laid it down for about two or three hours to get up and go right back to work on September 11th. I was living in the city and every night before I went to sleep because I had a really great view of the Twin Towers so I could lay in my bed and right between my feet were the Twin Towers so I would, I would see the twinkling lights and imagine the people working there. The night before I got in very late uh, I had, had a, a rehearsal and you know we kind of goofed around afterwards so I probably got in it, went to sleep about 4 a.m. which is unusual, which was really usual for them for me to be up that late. The night before 9-11, unfortunately, I was at work because I handled the international settlements and I had to work on a very large trade uh, with Hong Kong and having to work on their time frame, which were hours difference from us, I was there until 9.30, 10 o'clock. 
and um, I since realized I was by myself in the department. However, it was not unusual of me to take on the task of doing uh, the or going the extra mile, and um, nothing unusual. Um, I knew there were securities downstairs, so there was no fear. I had my business done. I took a cab home. And it seemed a regular night. It was actually my sister's birthday. <laughs> the night before was just like any other night. Uh, September 10th was uh, Monday night. It was unremarkable, normal, and uh, not particularly uh, unusual in any way. There was absolutely no sense of anything different that was uh, going to happen. Preparing to go to work the next day, I actually, um, in January of 2001, I adopted a little boy. And it was difficult for me to take him to daycare, hop on the train, go to work, worry about getting back on the train, getting him in time. Um, so it was always like a plan in my head how, how I was going to do this. That's really the most that I think that I could remember the night before. Interestingly enough, I, I do recall uh, a little bit about the 10th of September in 2001 and uh, it, no, it had a big impact on me because I became um, through my work with the fire safety education program I became a substitute teacher I am a college graduate not an education major and on September 10th 2001 it was a proud moment for me I returned to Tottenville High School where I was a student as a substitute teacher. It was uh, a rainy day and finished up my normal 11-hour work days and got home roughly around 7 o'clock, 7.30 and sat down, had dinner. And there were talks of the weather clearing for tomorrow and so that was nice. You wouldn't have to walk in the rain. I'm at work and I, I think about the night before 9-11 quite a bit. Uh, I was working, I was working at 24, the night into the day. Um, so I get to the firehouse uh, Monday night at, for a 6 o'clock tour till the next evening at 6 o'clock. But yeah, I had uh, changed my mutual around so that I could uh, I'd see my cardiologist about something. And I had to take my kids to school Monday. It might have been the first day of school, I'm not sure, at the elementary school. We had several runs that night, nothing big, just going in, going out. Uh, great place. I knew the next day we had building inspection. I had everything pulled out for that. I had all my T's crossed and my eyes dotted. And I was wondering when I was going to be getting promoted. I figured I'd be maybe promoted by the end of the year or early next year. I don't really remember clearly, but from what I rec could recollect, it was just a regular normal night, me coming home from work, taking care of the children, my sister being there babysitting. She always babysat for the children since they've been very young. It, actually, since they've been newborn, right after maternity leave, I would go back to work. Just a regular routine night, nothing different. Nothing. It was just regular. I took care of the children. I put the baby to sleep. And my son, he was a pretty small toddler. And I had a newborn daughter. And just putting them to sleep, it was just like nothing. I didn't feel anything different, you know? Nothing out of the norm. Well, since I did work that day, I, I probably just had a very uneventful evening of going to bed a little bit early uh, in preparation for my next day's work. But I don't recall um, anything out of the norm whatsoever at that particular time. On September 10th, I was preparing for another work day in New York City and I had just been reassigned from one division of the company I worked for, which was Frankel and Company Insurance Brokers, to another division. Yeah, I was um, working, um, I worked for a corporate actions firm, they did um, corporate reorganization, so we were going, we were taking on a big job. And I remember everyone was called, you know, all hands on deck. And we'd actually agreed the night before to come to work an hour earlier. So that's something that definitely, wow. Um, it's definitely something that, um, that I remember. The night before 9-11, it was just an, another night watching TV, uh, having dinner. Um, go in the bed early. Um, we didn't do anything uh, that was uh, of, of very big interest, just a regular night for us. Getting ready for my daughter's first day of pre-K. 
I don't remember specifics, but uh, just getting ready for her first day of pre-K. I yeah, that's one of those weird things that it always pops up into my head. It it was raining cats and dogs, and the thing that always sticks in my mind is that I had left the trade center and gone over to where I catch my bus. I'd gotten on the bus, and right when I sat down on the bus, I remembered that I had left a gift that I had bought for my cousin's baby shower in my cubicle. And I was just like, ah, no big deal, I'll bring it home tomorrow. And it's just one, that's just one of those things that always kind of like pops back up in my head because it's like, I guess it's that sense of like, tomorrow never came type thing, you know? And uh, so, but that's the thing that always sticks in my head about the Monday night before was that it was raining really hard and that I was supposed to bring home this gift and I didn't. And my last thought about it was, ah, I'll get it tomorrow. Uh, well, it's the beginning of the school year, so I'm a school teacher. Um, uh, not really, I don't really remember. I was probably watching Monday Night Football and... Nothing really, just hanging out at home. Didn't go anywhere. Didn't work, I was doing the next day. It was the first week of school. I was uh, eighth grade. I was my last year at the school I was at. I was excited. We were the, the, the big kids on campus now. We were, we were ready to rule the school. I was excited to go to school. I, I, it was, I wanted to, it to be over. I wanted to move on. But other than that, normal school night, everything was as it's supposed to be. The night before 9-11, that's life before 9-11, so it's a totally different world. You just didn't realize it. But for, for me, I was living uh, up north of the city, about 50 miles away, um, on a beautiful lake. And Monday night was our uh, drill nights at our fire department, so I went to drill. You know, normally we were doing, a, I believe, a mass casualty drill, so it's pretty ironic. And, um, you know, just uh, doing our thing, helping to train the younger guys, and uh, hanging out with the guys afterwards, you know, friends, hugging each other, and you know, all right, see you guys tomorrow, and uh, back to the lake, and it was just a beautiful evening, you know, surrounded by friends. The night before was a gorgeous night, you know, just like the next morning was beautiful sunshine day. That night was just a crisp, nice day in the country, and, uh, you know, I didn't have many cares, you know, other than enjoying my life right then, you know, so. Absolutely. Um, I work for a virtual health system, and I was working um, a 911 um, ambulance, response ambulance, um, took an extra shift for somebody at 4.30 in the morning to 11.30 in the afternoon and uh, I was in the middle of that shift when when we got the page and uh, so I will never forget where I was. It was remarkably beautiful. A clear day, there wasn't a cloud in sight, so the cold front for that September, it wasn't really cold cold, but it's cold front nonetheless, had cleared the air of all of the pollutants so you could see forever clearly and sharply. I guess the pilots have two ways of telling you what that sky looked like. CAVU is one of them, C-A-V-U, clear air, visibility unlimited. Or severe clear is the other phrase they use. So you could see forever. It was this beautiful, extremely clear, perfect day. It could not be more perfect. Crisp, clear, you felt invigorated. Very happy day, you know, very good day. And it was a beautiful day. The sun was out, there wasn't a cloud in the sky. It was dry, sunny, crystal clear, perfect late summer day. And I, my thought was, you know, how much better could it get than this? As far as the weather was a gorgeous day, the best day you could have ever seen. It was visibility. I said to myself, why am I going to work and I could go to the beach? It was beautiful. Spend the day with my children. Like uh, the guy said, low humidity, absolutely drop dead gorgeous day. Uh, I remember uh, got my coffee in the morning and I don't like, didn't like to hang out too much in the kitchen because that's the guy's area. I'd like to stop in, just show my face and do some chit chat and stuff like that. But then I'd, I'd take care of my stuff in the office. It was a beautiful day. It was a very nice day. It was. Uh, Clear skies, or just maybe a puff or two of wind, just enough to comfort you. And it was just a beautiful, lovely, gorgeous, 
Tuesday morning, absolutely normal, except that I was going in early. I could remember, you know, how clear a day it was and how beautiful a day it was and how there was nothing you couldn't see from, stat from the Staten Island side. It was such a gorgeous day. We were hiding underneath the trees because it was starting to get a little bit warm. And in the ambulance, you can get warm very quick. And I hate air conditioning. <laughs> I'd rather have fresh air than air conditioning. September 11th, 2001 was a beautiful blue sky day. It was unusually beautiful. And I noticed that. Uh, in addition, it was uh, a primary uh, voting election day, and so the polls were open and some people were going to vote before they uh, would go to work or conduct their daily activities. It was also uh, the first day of school for some school systems, and so as a result, uh, the offices perhaps were a little bit less uh, uh, filled with people at uh, the time of uh, the attack, as the events unfolded, uh, they really came from out of the blue, and that's uh, literally and uh, figuratively speaking, uh, when these planes entered the tower number one, the North Tower, it was right out of the blue sky. No one could ever have anticipated. Uh, and in fact, when it occurred, it was uh, incomprehensible what had happened. Well, my normal get-up time was around uh, 3.30, 3.45 in the morning. Uh, allowed me time to uh, leisurely get prepared in the bathroom, of course, uh, with a shaving and showering and whatnot. Uh, walked down to the train station, get there normally around 5 o'clock, gave me plenty of time to start reading the paper. About 25 minutes trip into Newark and transferring to the PATH train. The PATH train is operated by the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. And of course, my destination would be the World Trade Center, which was another 22 minute trip. I got up at about quarter past five in the morning, like I always did. I was getting ready for work. I had, was preparing my lunch, like I did every day. I had everything all set up, and I pulled this outfit out of the closet, and I said, this is good. I'll wear a shirt under this, this pantsuit because it's gonna be cold when I come out. Put my sneakers on, kissed my husband goodbye, and said, okay, honey, I'll call you when I get to work, and then, um, you know, I'll call you when I leave from work. Got on the PATH train and um, came into the World Trade Center like, every, like I'd done every other morning. I'd been up since 2, 2.30 that morning, got dressed and went to work um, and uh, was watching, I remember, I Love Lucy. My husband was on the shift that day that he would go and report it in at 6 a.m. And then if somebody called out sick, he would cover their shift. Uh, yep, getting up, going to work, uh, getting my son ready for daycare, leave him off, get on the train. I took the, uh, the number one uh, subway, 7th Avenue line, as usual. Uh, there was a stop within the concourse of the World Trade Center. Just a regular day, I used to take the subway in from Penn Station, come into the World Trade Center. Uh, take the elevator up. I, I remember seeing one of my neighbors who didn't make it. I start my day by coming up through the basement areas uh, out of the PATH station, which is inside the World Trade Center itself. I would always check the doors there and work my way through a, an access control door, uh, do a little scan and review of what's going on downstairs, make sure the functions, the security functions are working properly there. Then work my way up the elevator into the lobby the lobby visitor desks are just starting to come on duty. They started around six o'clock in the morning. I took the express bus into Manhattan like I usually did at the time, and there was a big delay. Everybody was delayed that morning, and apparently uh, I got to work late. Usually I would get there by, uh, oh goodness, what was it, like an 8.30, 8.15, whatever. I got there maybe 20 minutes late. Everybody was, the Brooklyn Battery time was packed, bumper to bumper that morning, so I know 
Afterwards, everybody said they were late, a lot of people. Um, you know, driving up the parkway, uh, taking my 40-minute ride uh, to, the, to the firehouse. And um, same routine every morning. You come in, how you doing, guys? And you sit down at the table and you have your morning coffee and the TV is on. On Tuesday morning, the 11th, I had woken up, was making coffee at the time. Uh, the dog uh, wanted out, took care of the dog. Got back to the coffee, and I got a phone call from a friend of mine, a battalion chief in New York C City named Ray Downey. Uh, Ray was the battalion commander for the special operations team for FDNY, and I had been doing work with him earlier in the summer at the Trade Center uh, using different devices to raise equipment uh, to the upper floors that firefighters needed rather than, than them having to carry it up the, the, the stairwells. And it was an interesting project because uh, it, it involved um, uh, lifts that the firefighters would carry to the upper floors and uh, it, we used the elevator shafts. Normally I roll into work like around, well I used to, roll into work at around 9.30 and then I would stay till like 8 or 9 o'clock at night. And because it was the first day of classes, everybody needed to be in early to get everything set up. Um, so I was kind of dragging that morning because I'm not used to getting in that early. But, uh, I, you know, I got on the bus. I would take the bus and get off basically right in front of Century 21 and walk through the plaza. There was the farmer's market that was going on that morning. And I stopped and I bought a loaf of bread from the Amish bakers and I put it in my backpack which also had my computer in it. That day I decided I was going to take the 4-5 um, the down and I took the 4-5 down to Wall Street, walked down Pine Street to my office at Wall Street Plaza. Everything was normal. Getting up that morning I remember I wore a blue crisp blue shirt, blue skirt. I took the bus as usual. I remember passing by my favorite restaurant, saying hello to the lady that was standing outside, the waitress, and took my bus and went to work uh, on a normal Tuesday morning. Nothing unusual. I didn't want to go to work because it was such a gorgeous day, so I found a reason to play hooky. And literally, living on the lake, the, the fish were calling me to go fish it, you know, so <laughs> I, uh, I went out on uh, a little boat and, you know, cast the rod a couple of times, caught like a couple of nice uh, big mouth bass. I live on Staten Island. I was working at a high school that was directly across from the World Trade Center. It's the furthest point you could be right next to the Staten Island Ferry, uh, McKee High School. We are up on the top of a hillside and uh, I can remember coming down Victory Boulevard, the main hill, going down before you go up again. Went to work. I was, uh, I'm one, of, I was one of the deans of the school, so I was working in the uh, cafeteria at, uh, at the time for you know, uh, late breakfast, early lunch, whatever it was. Yeah, it was a typical morning. You know, My father was at work, and he called every morning. And apparently, I, I remember answering the phone, he asked, did I get called to substitute teach because he was on his way home. And I was like, nope, all right, have a good day, see you later, love you, same thing any morning would be. My brother and I, my mom dropped my brother and I off at school. My mom, she also works for the Board of Education, she's a power, so she went, our school where we were was only five minutes away from where she was. So she dropped us off to, at school and it was a normal morning until you know, we switched classes. I was in math class at the time. My middle girl, Jackie, said, Daddy, you have to take me to school today. It's picture day. I said, well, get your rear end moving. It's 7.30. I got to be at work at 9. I dropped off at school at 8. Beautiful day. I got to work about 7.30 that day. As I was busying myself on the phone with uh, a gentleman from our London office, we made a connection to uh, Brooke from Cantor Fitzgerald to resolve the very same tree that I was working on the night before. So I proceeded, I went to the office and I followed the signs for Tower 2 and just as I'm doing right now I pulled out my ID 
and on the reverse side is the barcode that you put over the scanner so it scans you in I get off the elevator I went to my desk just like I did it was around 8 o'clock in the morning and I put my my pocketbook down like I have here I put it down this particular morning uh, we were scheduled to make a demonstration of nine new doors on the observation deck that we had just put security access control systems in place on them. And we were going to demonstrate them to the manager of the uh, OBS deck for his approval to bring them into the system and turn them on for 24-hour duty. So approximately 8 o'clock, the systems administrator and I went up to the observation deck, which is somewhere between the 108th floor and the 110th floor in the roof line, to make sure that those doors were working and that when we went to make the demonstration at 10 o'clock, we would have no problems at all. You get there, and as, as much of a hassle as it was in the morning, just going up that escalator and seeing Welcome to the World Trade Center was just, it was like a gush, you know? It was, it was a good feeling. As I'm walking into the building, I'm looking up at the building, I'm saying, oh my God, look how giant this building is. I've only been working here six months. Um, and I always felt kind of, I don't know, I can't explain it. Even the day I went for the interview, something was just giving me, honest to God, I just got this feeling like, don't work here. I don't know why, it sounds crazy. Um, I just got a feeling of being very eerie. It wasn't right. I, I, I can't explain it. Anyway, that feeling came back to me that morning, and I was only in there six months. I still got that feeling here and there throughout the six months, but this morning was different. So I, you know, stopped at the farmer's market, I went through the plaza, and I went in to the mezzanine area, you know, just like I always did, go downstairs, show my pass, get on the elevator, go upstairs. And my company um, was on the 17th floor in the South Tower. We used to always complain, uh, I was going to use a different word, but <laughs> we used to always complain about the fact that we had no view whatsoever. I mean, you know, we could look out there, our windows and see the plaza and that was it. Um, but on that day, it turned out to be a really good thing that we were on a low floor. I proceeded along with everybody else and uh, towards Tower 2 to the 36th floor. Frankel occupied the entire 36th floor and half of the 35th floor. And on the way up the stairs towards Tower 2, there was this young musician who would play great violin music. And that morning, he was playing Mozart. And I stopped for like a minute just to, to listen. I'm thinking, OK, Mozart, send down your, your good vibes. Perhaps uh, there were, roughly speaking, um, a third of the staff were present. Uh, we had a, a significant staff, four floors, uh, 79th floor, 80. 81 and 82. I was on the top floor of our four off four floor uh, on 80, 82nd floor. I had my cup of coffee from the Roach Coach, <laughs> and then I went upstairs, started my day, sifting through files upon files to uh, to see which files were valid to keep for study. Went in. It was it was nothing. Made coffee. You know, stood around, chit-chatted with my, my colleagues, and then, you know, started just getting into work. Getting coffee, going upstairs. Uh, I wore sneakers to work and put my shoes on and went over to talk to a coworker that day. I had a picture of my son that I took uh, at home and wanted to show her, so I was talking to her at that, at that time. And I went and I sat at my desk and um, I logged on my, to my computer, and the funny thing was, I didn't put my pocketbook in my bag, in my drawer, like I usually do. I left it on the floor. And then I'm just logging in. Probably about uh, 8.15 or 8.30, thereabouts. And as usual, uh, I just turned on my computer, uh, reading email, and as I had done for many years, and still do to this day, uh, I was enjoying a uh, cinnamon raisin bagel and uh, a cup of coffee as I watched uh, or I, I looked at my screen and, and did email and 
maybe read some papers in my inbox. It was uh, very quiet, unremarkable. Normally in the mornings, we have a nine o'clock group meeting with the management. So I get ready for that, I get in about 8.30. Uh, I used to take off my shoes, get my coffee, drink my coffee. And then usually at about five or 10 to nine, my friend Brian would come down. He's also one of the senior managers. And then we'd go into the morning meeting, which was in a conference room, two offices from where I was. And I was on the 79th floor. I had a nice routine in my life. I was working, waking up every morning at 6 a.m., no alarm clock, feeling good and ready to go. I, was, each, I looked forward to each day and going to work and doing a good job. And I remember taking the, the boat, the Staten Island Ferry, into Manhattan. I was on the 8 o'clock boat. The boat tied up in Manhattan at 8.30. And I got on the subway to go uptown, a couple of short stops. And when I exited the subway at Houston Street at quarter to nine, things took a very big change. Uh, yeah, dispatcher. Yes. This is uh, off duty fire fighter Jermaine. I guess you got this already. But you got a plane crashed into the World Trade Center. Are you aware of that? You have a plane that crashed into the World Trade Center in Manhattan? World Trade Center in Manhattan. Well, where are you going from? I'm on Varus Street in Manhattan. Barrett Street in Manhattan. Uh, the, uh, the North Tower, World Trade Center. You are Tower? North Tower. You got... And the phone number you're calling from? Uh, I'm on a cell phone. I'm an off-duty firefighter. My name is Jermaine. Okay. Okay. The North Tower, Beach Street. You got Beach Street, guys. Okay, thanks a lot. Send them all because you got a major fire on the upper floors of the World Trade Center. We heard something on the regular radio that um, plane went into the Twin Towers. And I just looked at Jen, I said, turn the shit off. I said, this is just not even funny. So the radios are all blaring at this point saying there's an MCI, which is a mass casualty incident uh, at the World Trade Center and it was a small plane into the tower. I watched, my pager went off, it was 8.46 that we were paged at exactly when the first tower was struck. Um, called my supervisor and he said, we already have somebody en route. Um, go home, get your dog. I looked up and I saw this huge hole in the side of the building. I didn't expect to see that big of a hole. I was astounded by it. Uh, I had worked in the building for five years and knew that that many floors meant that that was a tremendous hole. And if that was coming out that way, I could imagine that, you know, even the incoming hole would, would be tremendous. We felt this rumble. The building started to shake a little bit. We sort of looked at each other and said, what the hell is that? And about that time, the uh, radios went off. We've just been hit by an airplane, Tower One. Big fireball, huge explosion. There's flames and smoke all over the place. There's debris falling, there are papers all over the place. When the first plane hit, it woke me up. So I was actually asleep, and, uh, but I didn't know that's what it was. And, and I looked around and I thought that something had happened, but I really hadn't heard anything. And then I looked out past my toes and I saw an amazing amount of smoke. And went to the window, and when you're that, when you're that close, it looked completely different than on television, which I didn't turn on, uh, because you could see the flames. The, the flames were three, four, five stories high behind the windows. At that point, there was, it looked, which looked like the sun that was going to come through our window. It was the explosion from the other building. I basically saw that and just ran. Uh, ran to the next stairway and just headed on down. Uh, shaking like you cannot believe, not knowing what happened. Nobody knew. Nobody was rushing, running. They were walking fast down 92 flights of stairs. I stepped off the elevator um, and it must have been right at 8.46, because when I stepped off the elevator on my floor, and what I heard sounded like they had dropped something heavy upstairs. And I hear, bang, bang, and I felt the building sway. And then I look up, and I see the nose of an airline plane come through the tower across the plaza. I heard a blast about, it was about 
7.45 or 8.45, 8.45. And um, all of a sudden, all my phone and Brooke said, what the hell was that? And I was like, I don't know. And I felt the building went to the left and came back to the right. And my coworker, Chris, pulled me and said, get down, we've been bombed. And then I continued to just, you know, head into the office. But before I could even get into the office proper, people started coming out of the office saying that a bomb had gone off somewhere. But then at about a quarter to two or thereabouts, you heard something and you looked out the window and you saw the people just scurrying out. And they looked like ants coming out of the ground. And then I saw papers flying around, so it was obvious. We didn't know what happened, but it was obvious something happened. The building rocked. Like in a train, you know, when a train center comes to stop and you, that's what the build, that's what it felt like. And, and that's when I think we, everybody changed. Uh, Somehow became aware that something had happened. This was just after 8.46 uh, a.m. when the first plane entered uh, tower number one. I looked out the window and I, what I thought I saw was confetti rising going up and I thought this strange what I later realized was this was not confetti these were eight and a half by eleven sheets of paper but the enormity of uh, the, and the scale of the buildings made it appear as though these were just small pieces of paper and I could see that tower number one was on fire and I could see the enormity and, and the extent of the damage. I felt a little jerk at the table at my desk and then um, the guy sitting next to me said, me and both said at the same time, what was that? It was a little jerk and then all of a sudden we felt a big and that's when Peter, one of the guys we worked with, said under the desk. That's all I heard and I jumped under my desk and I just sat there and I thought, hey wait a minute, I didn't sign up for this. What the hell is going on? So we all got up and we all went like this. How'd they do that? Dear God, how stupid are you? You can't see a hundred story building? What's the matter with you, you idiot? And we just stood there like fascinated. We didn't know what to do. I just remember looking up and a gentleman by the name of John Yehovah comes running out of his office. His booming voice said, Caroline, turn on, turn up the volume. The um, World Trade Center has just been hit or something. A few minutes later, I was pulled from under the desk and the securities came up and uh, they said that um, it was a minor accident. There was a plane, something, a plane hit the roof of the building. However, don't panic. At the time, nobody knew whether it was a bomb or it was just the minor accident on top of the roof. By then, you started smelling this burning and rubber and just, I, I, I do now smell this hairy smell of burning of hair and everything. And people started panicking. Then all the sprinklers went off and you were wet. Uh, some of us, I personally don't know if I had peed on myself or it's from the water that was now coming down on us. And we're just running down the stairs and I'm going, oh my God, what's going on? And I'm smelling uh, smoke. I'm smelling like fire. All of a sudden, I'm telling you, even before I ran down the stairs, there was smoke immediately in uh, all over. Anyway, I'm running down the stairs. I'm going, oh my God, what is this? Maybe it's an earthquake. What is it? You know, I, I just didn't understand it. And I'm saying to myself, oh God, you know, I want to get out of this. I'm saying, I'm pleading with God, give me 20 more years. I don't care. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do. I'm going down and I see a firefighter's coming up. And I, I, I said to my, you know, they're going up with the hoses on their shoulders. And um, a firefighter's coming up. A fire captain with a suit on is coming up with an axe. I'm saying, my God, why is he coming up? Usually they're down at the bottom. And, but I said to myself, my God, it must be very bad up there. They look petrified. When I tell you petrified, knowing that they were petrified, I'm saying to myself, what am I supposed to think? So I said to one of the firemen, I said, what's going on? He goes, you don't want to know? 
just get out of the building. I had been there in 93 and I didn't go out right away and I regretted it. That was a real bad experience in 93. So I decided to leave and I started down the stairs, very calm. We got to the 44th floor, which in the World Trade Center was the, one of the sky lobbies. And the um, personnel there, security or the building personnel were telling people to get out the stairs and go on the sky lobby and go back to your offices. <clears throat> they told us a plane hit World Trade Center 1. Uh, and that we were safer in the building, that there was debris falling down. So we all started getting on the 44th floor, but there was a mass of people in the sky lobby. And then just something inside of me just said, I, I want to get to the ground floor. Again, I think remembering how I felt in 1993. So I just started going against the traffic. Everybody was, and I just kept on going downstairs. We just had a, a plane crash into the upper floor of the World Trade Center. Transmit a second alarm and start relocating companies into the area. The World Trade said that tower number one is on fire. The whole outside of the building was just a huge explosion. They had determined that a plane had struck tower number one and that emergency help was on the way. But at that time, we had no sense of why a plane had entered tower number one or was it, um, you know, a small helicopter or some other type of uh, accident similar to what had happened at the Empire State Building when a plane actually entered uh, purely accidentally uh, one of the uh, upper floors. And over the loudspeaker, because one of the teachers, her daughter was working in lower Manhattan, so over the speaker they said, there's been an accident in Manhattan, there's nothing to worry about, we're just letting the teachers know everything's okay. And thought nothing of it. Then, slowly but surely, kids were being called out of school, little by little by little, and it just got a little bit more bizarre, and we were just a little bit more concerned. As I came in, I heard them talking about, you know, something was happening at the World Trade Center, like there was a, it looks like a small plane, and this and that, and I'm looking at the building on the, on the news, and I was like, I know that city, I grew up in Queens. It just didn't look like it was a small plane, and then I'm thinking, well, did they have a heart attack? I mean. It must have been a bigger plane, and he must have accidentally veered in, and they're explaining this thing. As I'm coming up to the top of the Verrazano, I saw the smoke. I said, well, maybe it's a pier fire, because you, you would get your pier fires in Brooklyn or Manhattan, and it's all black smoke. And when I got to the top, I saw the North Tower was burning, put on the news, and they said it was a small plane crashed into it. You know, people on the street are saying, a plane hit Tower 1, and that was when I first looked up and saw that there's all the smoke pouring out of Tower One. Initially, we didn't know what was going on. We really didn't. We had no idea. When I exited the subway for the first time, I could see with my eyes what had happened. I looked up and I could see the towers on fire, aflame horrific, terrible. I knew that people must have been killed, and I knew this, this was uh, an event of great significance, so much so that my first thought was to watch, because this is history happening, and I would witness history. I would watch it. But perhaps my instincts and my need to survive uh, uh, got the better part of my judgment, which I, in retrospect, was the right thing. And I thought, no, uh, I think I will just get as far away from here as I can. I know my first take on it was, uh, well, no major airliner or anything is going to crash into the World Trade Center. Uh, it was probably some errant um, smaller plane or some private pilot or whatever. But in looking at it, the, the damage was a bit, a bit significant. And don't forget, we're getting the first pictures coming in, so the, the smoke wasn't really at its full billowing at, at the time. And so it, it could have possibly been a, a smaller plane. And that's the take we're all trying to have on it. The, the thought of terrorism or anything like that, not even in our, our minds. It was an accident. Um, so as we continue to watch, um, it, it does start looking uh, really uh, bad. 
I remember hearing on the news, oh, uh, something went into the World Trade Center. It's some pictures from a, a, a tra traffic helicopter of, you know, like the side of the building, the side of the North Tower. And at the time, you could see a little flame, and they said, no, oh, they think maybe a small plane went into it. And the first thing I thought was, I bet that ultralight guy from a week before lost control and, and went into the side of the building. And I was thinking, that, no big deal, you know, it's just a little bit on the outside. And the angles they showed of the uh, North Tower, it, from the TV clips that I saw quickly, didn't look like much. And they came across second alarm on the voice alarm, second alarm in Manhattan, box 8087. And the running joke in some of the busier areas is when you have a high-rise fire in Manhattan, it's kind of like, you know, a, a, a garbage pail fire or something like that because the buildings are so complicated that even a small smoke condition is, is, is a major thing in, a, in an occupied building of, of 10 or 20,000 people. Then you hit third alarm, you know, fourth alarm, and then the, the pictures were coming in on the news because it was on every station. And you could see, like, oh, this thing's really cooking. And uh, it's tough to get perspective on a building that large. The truck got the alarm. I think they went on the north. They, they were assigned early, third, maybe a third alarm on the, uh, the north tower. Uh, that was the way the first building was hit. They, they took off because it's a double house, the engine and the truck. Engine 1 out of Manhattan. Engine 1 out. World Trade Center 1060. Send every available ambulance, everything you got to World Trade Center now. At that point, we took off and we headed down to the, the main uh, highway. And as we got onto the highway, two other fire department units were going past us. I think that's the first time that we saw the one tower burning. The plane, the second plane had not hit at that point. When I emerged from the subway at Houston Street in Varick, which is one mile north of the Trade Center, I heard a woman say, look at the fire. So being in the business, I instinctively looked up. I did not see the impact of the plane, but I witnessed the result of it probably moments after impact. I had a perfect view from one mile north of, looking directly down at the north, out, north tower, which the plane impacted the north face of the north tower and the upper floors. So I witnessed a fireball hundreds of feet in the air. I witnessed the structure of the building punctured, probably 15 floors high from up to down with, and a huge fire coming out of it. I knew exactly what it was. Even though I didn't see the plane, uh, you would think oh, it was an accident, it was a small plane. I knew exactly what it was. I had been there for the previous attack in 1993. I was on duty and responded that day, and my greatest fear was, what if they ever took these towers down? I went into emergency mode uh, immediately upon seeing what happened, and instinctively, I called the dispatcher directly, and I was giving him a report of what I saw, and evidently, since I called direct, uh, that was one of the first calls the department received. The dispatcher wasn't even aware of what I was talking about, so I repeated myself. And, uh, and as I was giving that call, I could hear in the background the noise of the police horses. The horses from the mounted unit, which were located nearby, were responding. I could hear the clip-clop of the horses. I could hear ambulances. And I heard from around the corner, from my location, engine 24, ladder five, I could hear them turning out onto quarters, out of quarters to respond. So uh, I, I knew what we were up against right from the get-go. Send them all because you got major fire on the upper floor of the World Trade Center. We had a, a large fire to fight and we had a great possibility of losing a lot of people, especially at that time in the morning. I had worked there and I remember seeing thousands and thousands of people coming in that Trade Center from the path train alone. Panic must have struck in. Certainly the people upstairs were dead. I got onto the elevator, and this is building two, of course, and when I got downstairs, there wasn't anybody in the lobby. And when I walked through the revolving doors to walk through the concourse area to run over to building one, there wasn't anybody in sight. 
Now this is quarter of nine in the morning. And normally we have thousands of people roaming around, coming and going, either transiting through the area or getting from where they stopped off to pick up their breakfast and to get to the elevators to go into their building and whatnot. As I make my way down, I see that the lights are out as I get closer to building one. And when I got very close to it, the huge hanging signs that would tell you where to go, here for PATH, there for Tower 2, somewhere to go to World Financial, etc. These are very large stainless steel signs and they're all bent and twisted. And as I get around the corner, there are no lights now, except the security lights and the sunshine that's coming in through the windows. All the sprinkler heads are spewing water. And I stop and I look. Now I know what happened. You know, what had happened was that fireball that had come down through the elevator shafts had bounced around the lobby, swung around the lobby, and came right through the revolving doors. And that heat melted the fuses, and so now the water is spilling all over the place. So I took a couple of showers getting into the revolving doors, got in and started with the evacuation plan, which was to send everybody out towards West Street, because that's where we would normally have the first responders coming, the fire department, uh, the ambulance corps from the various hospitals, or from the EMTs that would come in, police. And so I'm sending them out that way because if they're going to need treatment, they're going to be triaged as soon as they hit that area. But shortly after doing that, a fireman comes up to me and tells me, Sir, it's not a good idea to send them out that way. It would be better if you sent them through the concourse up to Church Street. Now, the reason it was going to be better, and he told me it was dangerous out there or unsafe, was that some of the people that were trapped above the impact point. You know, the plane hit around the 93rd floor. And two or three floors above it were heavily damaged. But in doing so, the plane took out all of their escape routes, the stairways, the elevators. They were all taken out by the impact of that aircraft. And they had only one more option because if they weren't burned to death, killed on impact, or suffocating from the smoke, they had one more option. You make your peace with God, and you, you take that other option, or you stay with one of the other options. And that last option was to jump. There was a guard, uh, security personnel from the building, that was advising uh, people to return to their workstation. Do not go down to the plaza area. Do not exit the building. Uh, it was a terrible, tragic misjudgment. Uh, but the reason was, uh, ostensibly, to protect those from debris that was falling down because of the, uh, the plane that had uh, struck tower number one. There was a moment of uh, inner thought. Uh, I doubted that that would be the right thing to do to return to my office. After all, uh, I'm a New Yorker. I'm a survivor. I have an instinct that says if something has happened nearby, like a fire or any sort of potential problem, get as far away from it as you can. What would I be doing? Going back to my office and sitting down and writing emails. I mean, it was inconceivable anyway that I would just go back uh, and continue my work. Uh, but th that all happened in just a few seconds. Uh, I was thinking, I don't think so. And then I felt the second plane enter the tower I was in. And I felt the building shake. I felt it move. And I knew instantly this was not an accident. This was an attack. This was a terrorist attack. And I thought the building may collapse at that moment, and I thought this might be the end of my life.
it still wasn't, uh, the, the pulse wasn't beating too hard yet at that point. And then one of the guys, I guess the house watchman came running in and he goes, the South Tower was just hit. I saw the plane fly right up, right up the, uh, the East River, or the Hudson River part is there. And he goes, we're under attack. It's a terrorist attack. And I have to tell you, I felt like I got hit with, in the head with a hammer. I was like, why did I, see, why didn't I see this? What was I thinking? And uh, I was like, wow, really? And then we really started focusing on the news. But um, then we got the, the response ticket to go. We were signed on the fifth alarm for the South Tower. Yeah, I'll do the FDR drive. Definitely something hit the second tower. Possibly two-thirds of the way up. You got visible fire showing out there. Suggest to the incident command to transmit a fifth alarm for, to uh, Tower 2. Brooklyn to my hat with an urgent. Call for David.